if you're comfortable, you're not growing. Uh, you need to be a little less comfortable and, and move yourself into positions where you are stretching and be a little less comfortable and get comfortable about being less comfortable. Waterfest is a catalyst for economic development. It, it's supposed to bring people into town that might not otherwise have a reason to come here uh, to give them an opportunity to meet people, to uh, develop a relationship with those people. And you're dealing with people that are performing and not performing, and you're managing a budget, which happened way before I was involved in any of that at, in, at work at, in my career. It built my skill sets for managing people and resources at a very early age, which helped me prepare myself for opportunities as they came along in my career. Welcome, 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 everybody. We're going to start uh, kicking this thing off. I wanted to first give a, a big thank you to the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce for helping us put this together, as well as helping us corral Mike Dempsey in the house today. So big, uh, big round of applause if we can for Mike. Thank you. <laughs> you can get him louder than that. Yeah. Yeah, it's really a treat to have you in here, Mike. And uh, for those of you that are that are new or this is the first time you're, you're tuned into this in the stream or you're coming in person, we put together a show called the Local Legends Series. We're trying to find people that have uh, some great business leadership, entrepreneurial roots, and ties back to the Oshkosh or greater Fox Valley area that are willing to kind of share some of these different business t uh, tips for entrepreneurs, small business owners, or other business leaders in the community. Uh, this was this was a, an idea that, that John had approached me with, and we were able to put this together, and we are more than happy to have Mike on as our guest today. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, Mike, tell us a little bit, I guess, about yourself. You know, where did it where did it start for you when you were just a, a wee lad, you know? Um, I, I was born in Oshkosh, and uh, I was eight of eight of nine kids, and uh, had the benefit of observing my older brothers and sisters get in and out of trouble, so <laughs> I had that kind of education. And um, at the time, I, uh, we lived in the town of Algoma, and we had a country school named Boyd School, and we had three rooms, nine grades, three teachers, and so when you were in that, in that room, you had the, op the opportunity to observe the other classes working, or the teacher working with the other classes, and mm -hmm. Uh, working with the upper graders, so again, I, I got a chance to observe a lot of, lot of, uh, a lot of what was going on ahead of me, so I could look forward to that. What were you like as a student? Not very good. I really? Was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was a student of uh, sociology. <laughs> a, pl a plus in social. You know? Yeah, yeah I, I always tell my kids I, I made straight A's in school, but my B's were a little crooked. <laughs> Good enough to get about a B, you know, or a C, or whatever it happened to be. No, uh, that's really interesting. So, what, you know, eventually you you really built a successful career as a banker and a leader in banking. But where where did that idea start for you? Where did where when did you get interested in it? Well, uh, I was pretty uh, involved in athletics throughout school and um, and football, wrestling, that kind of thing. And um, and when I got out of high school, I, I I was in college and I went back to the high, uh, high school and and ended up coaching at high school wrestling and refereeing high school wrestling and and uh, one of the kids there was the son of a of a banker and uh, and was observing me handling kids and and doing doing good things and uh, gave me a shot at banking. Yeah, well, tell me a little bit about being a coach because I think that's a that's a skill that applies to lots of different aspects. Of well, life. it helps if you know the craft and and I was. I had pretty good understanding of what was going on in wrestling, but it's you're as much as a big brother or a counselor as you are anything. And so dealing with uh, high school kids in particular, like they're going through so many changes and challenges. So a lot of one-on-ones with high school kids that are um, having you know growing pains, and you know relationships with their parents or their families or their girls and what have you, and all the challenges that go through kids. So you end up a real you end up with really good close relationships with the kids you're coaching. So it, it worked out well for me and it, it, it was a growth opportunity for me as well. So you get started in banking. How, how did you start to grow your career? Because I know a lot of folks in here, they even if they're not entrepreneurs, they, they might have uh, some type of 
ambition or they're trying to grow and you, you've done that at all different levels you started out from the bottom kind of and worked your way into this how did that work well i i ended up i First of all, I was kind of interested in, you know, trying to be an investment guy. And so I, sure. I, when, when I was offered an opportunity to join the bank, it was in the trust department. And I, I got to buy and sell some stocks and do some investments and work in their accounting area. And then I had some relationships. And then some turnover happened in the organization. And there was an op opportunity for me to stretch myself. And so they put me in a position where I was way over my head. And I pr probably, most of my career in my growth areas, I was cons consistently over my head. <laughs> and I was battling to catch up and, and, and get better and, and be uh, functional. And, and, then, uh, and, and then the next step would be get over your head into something else. But uh, working hard, long hours, uh, uh, being coachable, and understanding what that's like to take instructions and, and, and deliver whatever was asked of me. I think that's an interesting point you brought up. So. You, you took positions that you felt like you were in over your head with, and there's a lot of uh, a debate, you know, where, where people give advice that's fake it till you make it, and there's other people that say, no, you really want to know what you're doing before you get into something. And it seems like when you're in over your head, there is a little bit of a, a, a balance in that in there, right? You want to be able to challenge yourself or have confidence that you'll be able to go forward. What do you think? Well, you, you have to have a, a patient manager and boss. <laughs> you have to have somebody that's willing to invest in you and your development. And uh, I had the opportunity to work for a number of people that uh, really supported me through that process and gave me all the time I needed to c continue to, to develop. And, um, and I observed that and uh, that helped me when I was on the other side, helping other people stretch themselves. Yeah, do you think that that's a good idea for people to try to like, like what, what, makes, what made you want to try to challenge yourself? Is that are you born with it, or do you find it, or, or where does that come from? Well, at first, it's a it's a little nerve wracking, but you know, once you get used to being out there on that ledge, it's you get comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> no, you what I what I try to do is instill. Uh, you know, I don't. What I try to tell folks or people that are listening would be to. You know, reflecting on your career. Well, an entrepreneur needs a good banker. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you start there. Uh, well, the entrepreneurs have to really know their craft and 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 really be able to take a punch and be resilient and have the um, have that uh, tenacity that gets gets them through. Uh, failure. There's always, I mean, you're going to fail and fail and fail and then you succeed and then you keep failing to the next level and as businesses grow. So uh, entrepreneurs really need to be able to um, suck it up, dust themselves off and come back at it. They have to be all in. They have to be prepared to, um, to do anything and everything to continue to make it successful, to make sure they're making their payrolls and uh, take care of their obligations and, uh, and, and take advice and, and put it to work and uh, continue to uh, reinvest in, in solving for success. Can you tell looking, you know, when you first meet with some of these different entrepreneurs or business owners, can you tell early on in the process which ones you think have it and which ones don't? And which, uh, which characteristics can, that, can, you, can you figure this out with a short period of time? Well, one, t <laughs> one test is, if, if they're more interested in their paycheck than their employee's paycheck, uh, that's a sign that they're probably going to have some difficulty when they have difficulty. They won't, they won't know who to pay first, which is not themselves. And so you really have to be um, taking care of your employees and all of your obligations and uh, work through it. So, mm -hmm. um, and they have to be prepared. They have to have a, they have to have a goal. They have to be... Um, really passionate about what they're doing and, 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 and have some capabilities about, you know, how, how it, what it takes to make a payroll and sustain that. And um, those are, that's a starting point. Yeah. So when you're looking through, I mean, one thing we do, we, we get ideas in here all the time, all sorts of different industries and things like that. And they're putting together their business plans. And the reason usually you're putting to get together your business plan is because it's going to go in front of a banker or a grant committee or a board. And you've probably seen hundreds of these, thousands of these over your lifetime. What's, what's the winning ones look like? Or when do you feel a warm fuzzy after reading through some of these different proposals or grants or business plans? Well, I, I, I want to locate the motivation. What, what's this all about? Why? why, why? The, the plan is sort of the how. And, you know, but what's behind it? So because the, the how and the plan is going to evolve or change, it's, it may sometimes it takes a hard left and sometimes it 
goes a little too fast and sometimes it goes a little too slow. But the motivation is key in order for them to, to, to have, the, have the resilience to be able to, to pivot and make adjustments. And so my first step is to understand why is this happening, what's this all about? And then, then I'll test the plan to see if it makes some sense and if they have enough capital and to, to take, I'll go through the what ifs and their assumptions and, and, and try to see if they're valid and to discuss what, what could change in those assumptions and what can they control and what they can't control and do they have the ability to manage through something they can't control and, and um, take it from there. Yeah. I think uh, one thing that I think is really interesting about your story is you were involved in kind of the Waterfest very early on beginnings. Tell me how that started, how those ideas came about, and your involvement in the entire process. Well, Waterfest was started by the Chamber, and it was started, at, and the motivation there was to, uh, to create a, a sense of positive uh, self-esteem for the community which had kind of lost its luster during the Rust Belt days of the early 1980s, mid-80s, where un unemployment was well into the double digits, and it was real. And it was probably a bloodier time for this market than, uh, and I'm talking about the Midwest in general, for, uh, from, from standpoint of job creation that, uh, than it ever has been, even through the Great Recession and this last uh, pandemic issue. So that was really brutal for for the communities in, in Wisconsin. We lost a lot of jobs to other states. We lost them to, to overseas. And uh, a lot of that stuff we're trying to get back, but we're still recovering from that time as a, as a, as a country. Um, so w w when, when we were out trying to recruit businesses to the community, the chamber was having trouble when they'd bring somebody in that might be interested, they'd visit with the community itself and going, what's, what's cool about this place? What, what do you like? And, Everybody was kind of Eeyore, half, the glass was half <laughs> empty, they were tired, they were beaten down, they, they had lost their self-esteem and, and really lost uh, track of why they, why they selected this place to live. And so the chamber and the city fathers got together and they said, well, what can we do? And they came up with a new slogan, Oshkosh on the water, and they painted it on the, on the water towers and they made logos and the county got into the wave of the future and we said well we got to accentuate the water the waterways and you know how do we how do we promote that great awareness and and they came up with the the, the the world's largest free festival it was a weekend event that uh, lost tremendous amounts of money <laughs> but that's for promotion <laughs> And uh, everybody potted in for two or three years as a weekend event, and they got the message out. People began to understand that it, we're, all, we're all about the quality of life here, and that involves reminding people about the natural resources, our educational system, our, 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 uh, um, our, our school system, the, the um, hospitals, and, uh, and just the fact that it's a great place to you know, live, work, and play if you can work. Yeah. <laughs> so so they, 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 they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish, and then they came to, uh, at the time I was in the JCs with a number of other people, some of whom may be in the room, and, uh, and, they, <laughs> and so some of them came, they, they tried to offload it on us <laughs> and see what we could do with it. So <laughs> as the JCs, uh, and, and we'd put on a couple of other events that were festival oriented, and we kind of went, okay. If you, know, if you guys help us with the sponsorships, we'll take it on and see what we can do with it. So we had to move it from the skill center down, and we had to find a place for it because we couldn't put it on the skill center. They were tired of it too. So we said, well, where can we put it? Well, we thought, well, let's put it right in the middle of where the opportunity is for improvement here, and that is right downtown, right bullseye on what needed some attention and to draw attention to the opportunities down there. The, the hotel and the convention center was new at the time, uh, the Grand had just gone through a, a revitalization, and we said, well, we can somehow put those two stages to work, and then we put up another four or five stages in tents, and we had a carnival and la laser light shows and water ski shows and so Phoenician of, parades. Multiple sites we, were going on. We had it all downtown. We yeah. tried to get, get it going and, and go really big with it, and, um, and that lasted for three years with the JCs, and we made money one year, lost our butts the next, <laughs> and made just enough to break even the third year. And the JC said, you know, uh, uh, you know, we really can't run this thing anymore. So then uh, Chuck Hurdle, a local attorney, and I got together with uh, Rob and John, and we said, well, we can take this back, and let's make it a 
Rob had just started a, a weekly concert series and we observed it on Thursdays and we were looking at it going, and it was a little free thing with a guitar sitting out on the lawn and we kind of went, well, I think we can take that to another level. And so we didn't want to destroy all the, the value we had in the um, sponsorship momentum. And so we said, well, let's, let's take Rob's, let's, let's hijack Rob's Thursday night deal and, uh, and let's make it Waterfest, but put it into a weekly concert series so we're not burning out our volunteers. Uh, uh, fans could come one or more times versus dedicating one weekend. We get a, a better deal on some of the touring artists and, um, and we could, you know, maybe sell wristbands for people that might have a cocktail, or not a cocktail, but a beer, and, uh, and, um, and kind of make it underwritten. So we moved into that direction, and it's, it was quite successful. You know, with the, the, the number of bands that we had that are, you know, in the, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that were playing on a trailer or a showmobile <laughs> is incredible. I mean, so we had what a... What were some of those early bands that you... Well, we had the Guess Who, Cheap Trick, yeah. uh, Eric Burden and the Animals. We had some really great bands that were... Uh, we had uh, Three Dog Night. <laughs> I mean, all these bands were playing on a showmobile. And, <laughs> and we were charging two bucks for a beer wristband and... and uh, and, um, and this made money early on. Well, sort of. We did. We did. We did pretty good for the. You know, we did okay. <laughs> <laughs> we were still in business. So let me oh, yeah, that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it did. It was actually. We had a. We were actually building up a nest egg until we got into the the amphitheater scene, and that became a, a higher budget proposition because of the occupancy costs and the production and everything else. So the the nature, the scale of the operation changed drastically as when we went into the amphitheater. Wow. So t tell me a little bit about how you thinking through this, you've got this kind of a banker mindset and then you've got this entrepreneurial kind of activity. W where did you find this balance of intuition versus does the math work? And how did you kind of navigate that with a team of, of a lot of folks that are a lot more conservative, in a lot of projections <laughs> and things like that? Well, we, 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 we went based on history and we, we kept on building. And what Waterfest would do is it, Unlike a lot of events, we reinvested our money into the event itself. So whatever we had a plus year, we reinvented it. We reinvested into a, a, a better budget for the next year, and it threw out enough cash flow to handle that budget. And then, for the most part, we kept reinvesting it. And we we we, we prepared a model that said if we don't get rain, we'll do okay. And then we had a model that said if we get rain two and a half nights will be okay. And it's, it's a tricky business. Uh, any kind of outdoor event is, is subject to weather. We had a pretty good finger on what the demand was. And we knew from history, we'd bring back three bands that had been there before, three money makers that were local, and then three new bands. And so we'd come up with a formula where we'd kind of risk, risk the demand on three different bands that might be something new. And that was kind of our philosophy going through. So it, it sounds like it's a little ambitious, but it's, it was pretty conservative in its approach to, to uh, getting the results we needed in order to contain and or to actually grow the festivity. Yeah, I think that it's, it's interesting hearing a promoter's perspective on that because that's kind of a weird science in itself. Is how do you, you, if you build it, they will come, right? How, do you, how did you get anyone there? How did you get the <laughs> momentum? Well, what was pretty exciting for us, and what we, the challenge for us was we were going to put this on this little postage stamp uh, park, which was tiny, and it was in the middle of a very blighted area. There was no, there was no river walk. Uh, the downtown was half empty. Uh, it was, it was a, an industrial wasteland, the brownfields up and down the river, and so, the, so what, the, what we were challenging the community was we were going to we were trying to establish the fact that if you do something worthwhile in an area our downtown people will come if you have value people will come the sponsorships allowed us to deliver value that didn't exist anywhere else and that's still true today where the, the price of admission is you know a third of what you might have to pay at the Pabst or someplace else to, to uh, see a live event like that so the, 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 the secret recipe for us is providing value in the, the price of admission, um, value in, in the concessions, which is no more than what it cost if you went down to a bar or something like that. We don't overcharge for any of that. We never did. We made it very easy and affordable. We wanted anybody and 
to be able to afford to come in at, at some at, in some fashion. Um, very inclusive attitude toward it. And so um, when people decided that was a cool thing and it was a thing to do, and you, do um, we created an awareness from the community standpoint, private public partnerships that maybe there's something we could, maybe there's a pulse down here, we can do some more, which began the discussions about uh, the, the, um, the amphitheater and the river walk and some of those other things started to fit in. So, What years did those start to come into play? The uh, amphitheater and... Uh, early 2000s, 2005, six, something like that. Yeah. And, uh, but we had a, we had a, uh, a sponsor event uh, that helped recognize that and brought people together in the convention center with this with the concept of the amphitheater and we were uh, we had my, uh, uh, Michael McDonald in there and the and the uh, American English and we brought in the we brought in the wallets <laughs> and got him got him in there to get continue to get excited about the possibilities and and you bring him down there and you show them the riverfront and what it looked like at that time versus what it could look like and all of a sudden, the Oshkosh Foundation, uh, other people started to say, well, let's get behind this thing and take advantage of this momentum and do something with it. So uh, that worked out very well. And then from there, it took a, a couple of years to get it to the uh, c to completion. But there were some brave, very brave people, C.R. Meyer and the Leach family and uh, Ted Leahy and a lot of people that got involved with this thing to to help get behind it, to make it, to actually reward all the volunteers and the chamber for all the hard work they did, putting this thing in a position where it could be leveraged into something special. What was it like uh, dealing with some of these, you know, A-list musicians just over the years? I mean, what was that's got to be stories in itself, right? Well, <clears throat> most of them have like careers that had done this and been down there. And you get them for a discount. Yeah, over here, so right? they were at the in the early '90s. They were happy to have some place to play. That was before the casino started to pop up and really pay a lot of money. So we could, we had a lot of bands that we could, you know, they were just playing for their supper almost, and they were you know great great bands, and um, and they were very happy to have some place to play, and and they were they understood what they were getting into. Some did, some didn't, <laughs> some that didn't were going what. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here? We had the uh, first time we had uh, a Starship, and uh, they stood on the stage, and uh, they looked out at the, the municipal bathroom that was out there. It has kind of a teepee look the roof, and they said, that's the first time we played in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a venue with a Starship in the middle of it. <laughs> we had, uh, we had uh, um, Lou Graham, who was with Foreigner, uh, was a founding member of Foreigner, and he... He, he was just restarting his uh, solo career after a, a bloody legal mess with Foreigner, and he, and he didn't have his promotion put together. And I was talking to his agent, where's the pictures, where's the photos, and the, the local paper was going, we need this stuff to order, put your ad in, and da da da. And so they pulled, pulled an old file fixture of Foreigner and put it in the paper. And Lou Graham came in the night before, so in the morning he's sitting in coffee down at the hotel going, Going, oh no, I'm going to get sued, <laughs> and so he was he was wild, and I, I caught a really good ear job from him. <laughs> Paul Ra Paul Rogers, uh, who's the founding member of Free and Bad Company, uh, he was he was in town, and he, one of the things he, had, he some of these guys require special treatment, and so he came in with his um, trophy girlfriend, and he needed a limo, not just a van, a limo from the hotel to the convention center. And he had and he had slippery boots on or something, some kind of cowboy boots with lifts in them because he was short, and uh, <laughs> he did not want to walk on anything but carpets because <laughs> he was afraid he was going to fall down. And uh, <laughs> so, in order to get him to that that the side of the convention center, we had to take the limo from the front of the hotel across the bridge, turn him around, and come back over the bridge, and drop him off by the carpet <laughs> coming into the thing. So. So, you know, sometimes you have those kind of things. But. I, I heard, I, I've heard, I don't know if this is true, you tell me, that musicians or their teams and their managers will make 
really ridiculous requests to test the attention to detail of the promoter. Is that true? Yeah, and the riders, they'll, they'll put odd, oddball stuff in there, like uh, no red M&Ms or... Um, so you get a whole thing of M&Ms with no red ones? All yeah, well, it's, we, that early on we took it literally, but it was really just to see if you read the darn thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you would actually have... <laughs> yeah, the, so they, you'd see something obscure in there and you go, what is this? And they just wanted to know you were paying attention. <laughs> but that is true. They'll do it. That's standard operating procedure for a lot of uh, bands. Do other industries do that that you've come across in the past, of putting bizarre well, so, things in contracts? Uh, some of the attorneys in the crowd would know that they put those things in there, and we have to find them. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that, that's really interesting. I think it's a, it's really a fascinating, you know, hearing how that came together and then over the years and it becoming such a staple in our community. Waterfest is just a household name, at least in this area of the state. And to know that that just started as an idea, you know, with a team of people that were able to put that together is really interesting. It's 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 a it's recognized throughout the country, but especially by the the talent uh, folks. Um, you know, we we used to have to call people. Now they they call us, oh, yeah. and so uh, they're looking for venues such as this, and looking for people that know how to put it on. We we do not chintz on any of the production or any of the needs, anything they really require. Uh, Carleen Grabner is really good at finding out what, what they need in their rider and what they don't need. And, and sometimes there's a lot of stuff in there that's a waste of money. That And so we'll talk to them on a practical level. And once we get the show advanced, we, we hone down the, the riders to get it to a, a level of what, what they need versus what they would waste. And, and, and uh, uh, But what they'll, they'll get whatever they absolutely need to put the show on and make it a good show. The crowd situation at Waterfest is really good. A lot of it from a fan st experience standpoint is, you know, they get to come up really close. They can high five a, a, a musician. A musician can do that with them. Uh, uh, it's, you know, we, it's a club atmosphere. So there's a lot of energy out of the, out of the fan base for the performers. Uh, Robbie Krieger from the doors was here and um, he was busy. He was on a tour and he was doing a lot of the city wineries and he goes, that is a boring situation. He was looking forward to playing Waterfest where the fans were up on their feet and cheering and screaming and, and even though it was raining, that show was dynamite. It rained all the way through with the, the piano player had to lift up his piano and empty the water out of it and yeah. set it back down. It was unbelievable. But he, 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 he was emphasizing the, the, the reward it is for an entertainer to have a crowd that gives that kind of response. And because it's set up in a way that you don't have a bunch of VIP chairs that aren't used in front, we have a, a club atmosphere where the the, the fans that want to be in front are in front. And the ones that are a little bit more um, voyeurs, they, they can sit on their chairs and enjoy the music from the, from the grass. So it, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an environment where performers that like to get crowd response get it. What are the different types of uh, what are the types of different types of tastes of the performers that you've kind of seen? I, I mean, like there are probably some that need that crowd response, or there's some that don't care. Or I mean, what are the different personalities you run into over the years? Some 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 bands you you, you are just mailing it in, they're doing their paycheck thing. Other ones really want to develop their fan base. And right now, uh, with the music industry the way it is, they're not making a lot of money on on. On, on record royalties or any kind of uh, residuals, they have to really go out and tour and play for their fees. So they're and so they're building fan bases wherever they go, and they're very very careful about their fan bases, and they're mining any market to get into to develop more fan bases. So they they take it very seriously as a part of their business plan to make sure they're uh, developing new fans that are regenerating interest in their music as they move through these markets because a lot of their other fan ba uh, fan bases moving on and so they've got to continue to earn new fans as they uh, go out and tour so for the most part they're in it for real they want a, they want a good fan experience and they want to deliver on it and they're very uh, respectful of the fans what's like the the vision for the future of what you want or what the team kind of wants waterfest to really turn into down the road well, Waterfest is, is, is a catalyst for it, 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 Waterfest is a catalyst for economic development. It, it's supposed to bring people into town that might not otherwise have a reason to come here, uh, to give them an opportunity to meet people, to uh, develop a relationship with those people, to think about what the possibilities are about investing or living here, and it's not just about Waterfest. It's about introducing people to the market. So, about a third of our our, our attendees are from out of market and and. Um, and, and 
to the extent that they find this, and they find, you know, simply the commercial aspects of it, restaurants and bars and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. that's cool. But they also look at the downtown and look at other investments. They go, this, this has a pulse. This, is, this has opportunity written all over it. So it's, it's part of the profile of the community to continue to act, to, to continue to give it life. What Waterfest is very, we were asked, uh, there's some other, some other uh, not-for-profit was interested in doing something else on a Thursday night and we're concerned about how we'd respond to it. We're, we embrace anything and everything that goes on any time of the week when people are investing their resources and, and, and time and talents into creating opportunities for people to enjoy themselves in our, in our community and to bring people to our community and to create a higher level of awareness. Um, so, you know, we're all about helping people, showing people how to get this done. Um, and, how, and if they've got other ideas, you know, we'll, we're happy to step aside. We're, we're very helpful. We've helped a couple of other not-for-profits with our organization and our, our uh, production group and um, introducing pe people that want to bring some shows to town to, to, uh, you know, to, to figure out how, what resources are available to pull off what they're trying to do. And the Chamber's been extremely uh, open about that, and we're here to help. Yeah. What are the what's is the lineup set now for this year? Or how yeah, do, so, it is. So unless something comes up that's you know that we can't yeah. Re refuse. <laughs> yeah. Who are some of the the big names we got coming in this year? Well, we we worked for almost a decade trying to get the Beach Boys in. Yeah. So that's they're they're coming. That's and, great. And I've heard they're actually they have the most hits of any band over the history of rock and roll. Is one they're, of the stats that I've they, heard. Yeah, if you think about it, every song's a Beach Boys. Well, Boy song. they're doing an and they're doing two seventy five minute sets of all hits. Oh really? Which is <laughs> they said no opening act. We don't want anybody tiring out. <laughs> so they're going to do seventy five minute sets starting at six thirty, and then another thirty uh, another one thirty minutes later after that's done. And, and I had a chance to witness it up at Cash for Cat, Catfish Days a couple of years ago with one of our guests out here. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that, their set was incredible. The sound was impeccable. Uh, it's, it's, it's a Beach Boys show. It's really good. It was really, really good. So they're, they're coming. That's great. We, we added uh, something that's a little, it's, I wouldn't call it edgier, but it's more current. Uh, we, uh, Government Mules coming in. They're a, they're a jam band that is a top-notch festival draw throughout the country and, and throughout the uh, Europe. Uh, Trombo and Shorty, who just closed the, uh, the Jazz Fest uh, in New Orleans, is going to be on that bill with them for a double bill in August. That'll be awesome. Uh, we've got some 80s rockers like um, Mike Campbell from, uh, uh, from the Tom Petty's band. has got an all-star band that's coming in that's on the 21st. Got the lead singer from Boston. He's he's going to have his show. He was a big hit last year. Uh, we, we can't promote it with the word Boston in it, but we can say what you know, whatever. But he's his show is legit. The legal <laughs> checks out. <you> know. <laughs> yeah. But but he, he put on a real crowd pleasing show, so everybody that went to that show last year will be back. Plus that'll be good. Um, we got Night Ranger coming back. There are a bunch of about a lot of hits. Tommy James and the Shondells. Yeah. I was probably born because of Tommy James, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Some people get it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're, we're very pleased to have Hairball back. They're a riot. And John got the pyro, pyrotechnics uh, approved with the city, and we're happy with the city. And we uh, just had a little time out here. The city's been extremely helpful, the police department, the parks department. Uh, they're very welcoming. They're, they help us solve for any concerns we might have. They help us watch on the weather and and other um, uh, crowd concerns. And uh, uh, so they're the city's been awesome. So we we couldn't do it without the city. Uh, one other comment uh, while I'm on this track is that you know it takes about 120 people to volunteer at Waterfest on any given night. We're always looking for help on that. So if you're interested, contact John at the chamber. Um, and everybody has a good time now. The, the volunteer groups raise money for their own uh, own concerns, um, and they have a lot of fun. They use it as a, a smoker for creating awareness for their purposes, and so it, it kind of it's a little bit of a give back. And um, and then we uh, we work with uh, uh, a, a number of people that really make it happen. Uh, the the the, the um, volunteers and the and the donors and the sponsors are, are really what make put the value into Waterfest. Uh, at least a third of every ticket is subsidized by their efforts and, and funds. Uh, we got Vic Ferrari for the last uh, hurrah. They're this is their farewell tour. Isn't farewell it? tour. Like and yeah. they, were, they and Road Trip, and Road Trip's also on the bill this summer, 
uh, really helped us financially in the 90s. They were, you know, they were partners. They would bring in their own production and put on their own shows. Uh, and uh, we, they were very affordable and very, uh, very interested in the success of the or, uh, the concept. Uh, they, it was another place for locals to play. Part of our part of our mission is to give uh, visibility to our uh, to our um, uh, Wisconsin-based artists as part of the package uh, and our touring artists to have a place to play and, and, and introduce themselves to new um, new fans and vice versa. Um, what else do we have? We have uh, uh, a rockin' band at the end of the s a season called Dirty Honey, which is, they were out, they're an up-and-coming band, kind of a Led Zeppelin thing, uh, that were out on tour with the Black Crows, so that'll be edgier and it'll rock. It's like a Led, Je Zeppelin, or the, yeah. Led Zeppelin genre? Something or, like that, yeah. mixed in with a little ACDC. I mean, it's nice. all, they really rock. Uh, first thing they ask when they're uh, taking a look at the uh, opportunity to play here is, uh, What's the decibel limit? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I wanted to give a, a, a moment for folks out here that might have questions to be able to ask them of you. You can say yes or no if you want to ask them. El, can we, uh, or, or why, can we get these guys a microphone if they have any questions? Uh, for Mike, just about entrepreneurship, business, kind of the community, and uh, some of his involvement or backstory. That's the closest we got to questions. I don't have uh, much to say about entrepreneurship. <laughs> uh, can you define what you consider a successful entrepreneur? <laughs> yeah. Well, one that's in business and pays their bank bills and their attorney's fees. <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent point. The, the other question is, what was the biggest uh, turnout or most? At Waterfest? Yeah. Uh, how many uh, people? Um, we still think it's the Bodines, uh, 2006, about 8,100. And after that, there's a few others that were uh, close to eight uh, and in the high sevens, including Ario Speedwagon and um, Doobie Brothers, Pat Benatar, um, to name a few. And the capacity is? 7,500. <laughs> <laughs> but it was determined after we had 8,100. <laughs> We don't know how many this fits. So yet. we were we were we were okay until they put a capacity thing, and then we're fine. And what's the most you lost in one event due to John, John canceled uh, Alice Cooper, I think. No, uh, Al, uh, the storm. rain, uh, the storm. That his. Storms. Well, we can't really tell you his fee because we that's not. But but it was six figures. And that had what you're also losing there is all your advertising and production and all the costs that go into. Bringing somebody to town, transportation, hotels. I mean, they were here to play. It was all set up, and it was a washout. He did go play golf at the country club. <laughs> <laughs> Little green outfit. Do the, do, do the artists kind of stick around ever and do stuff in the community? Well, good question. A um, couple times. Alice Cooper uh, was here for a few days, and he, he did his radio show from the hotel. He taped a few times for that show. And then uh, Michael McDonald was here for over a week. Uh, and he was preparing to do his Motown tour. Uh, we got him out on the boat and stuff. His, his wife went does the gas. She's great. Good people. But that's when he was re, re, he went on a very successful Motown tour, which had two, two releases and went on for two years, but it started in Oshkosh. Yeah, we'll have to get him on the podcast. No. Is there such a thing as cancellation insurance? I know there are for conventions and other events, and then with the pandemic. Yeah, well, we, we've looked at that. We self-insure. <laughs> uh, we we self-insure because we have a variety of evenings. So we have like nine evenings, and we kind of budget around trying to figure out how to survive if, we, if one of them is weather impaired or a washout. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it works for us, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but the insurance is very specific. It's like from this hour to that hour, and there's there's too much detail in that insurance to figure out how how to how to make it pay. So we, we just sort of self-insure. That's a good question. Good question, though. Yeah. We get it a lot. Could you explain a little bit about how you book somebody? How much prepayment there is? When do you pay? How much of the fee, and if because we're such a good event, do we have um, credit credibility? We we don't have to do all those prepayments. 
Uh, deposits. Uh, uh, some bands need deposits because they have to cash flow their business, so we appreciate that. Uh, some want it because of security in case we're, we don't have good credit. Uh, most of the touring acts ask for a deposit 30 days in advance, but that's probably on a cash flow. And by that time, they're 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 coming, and so it's and they and it's all in. So they're looking at you know paying for their plane plane tickets and uh, some other rehearsal time and that kind of thing. So. Uh, we went from having to make a deposit when we you know, uh, uh, started with the contract, which might have been six or nine months in advance, to, to right now it's typically 30 days for national touring artists uh, for a deposit, and it's usually 50%. Um, most of the other bands, it's all we pay them day of show. Um, some industry, rock is like that. Country, sometimes you can uh, you pay day of show. Is there, what's the, how much are we talking about to book some of these different artists? Are you allowed to kind of give ranges at all? I mean. Oh, well, our tax returns are public. So, I mean, our, our artist fees uh, this year will run somewhere between four and $500,000. And, um, and, you know, we do, a, we're really good at getting good prices on that stuff. Uh, so four and $500,000. And, and so from a cash flow standpoint, we usually need a hundred to 150 to cash flow that the, just the deposits alone. How, how do you how do you price an artist to see if they're a good deal versus how many people you think they can pull in? How does that how does the math work on that? Well, um, we try to we, we we if you're in a hard theater with, with a certain amount of seats, the rule of thumb is you need to you need to budget at sixty percent capacity. So you need to break even at 60% capacity on all expenses, including artist fees, insurance, promotion, all that other stuff. For us, it's not really a capacity thing. We kind of look at, well, what do our season ticket holders run? What do our sponsors handle? And we have a pretty good, pretty good idea on that. And then we look at uh, what do we think we can sell for VIP and what would be the general admission, and then we back into some pricing. A lot of the artists want to know exactly what we're pricing because they don't want to leave a lot on the table. So they'll kind of go, what's the capacity? And, and then you have to deliver a kind of a budget to them to see what's, you know, what their value is. So they look at that. And then at the end of the, some, some of the artists want a weekly update of, of how they're doing. Because they're trying to price their well, model. They want to know yeah. that, that the show's going to be okay. And, mm -hmm. and then some, a lot of places they play, they play, they pay a, a variable, they get paid on a variable, uh, take a base plus, uh, performance, but for us, we we look at going. Well, we can, we're going to get 500 of these sold based upon that, and you know, for the Beach Boys, you know, we think we'll do a thousand VIPs at X dollars, and then we think we'll do 2,000 in the in general admission at X dollars. Anything over that um, will help us pay for a loser somewhere else down the road, but. Uh, so we do take a look at it. We budget out each show in that fashion. We know how much our sound and lights and production are. Um, sometimes the hotel rooms are a little steep because some of those bands are bringing 24 people in for two nights. And then we have ground transportation we have to organize and all that. So some of that stuff can creep up on you when you start getting into the show and advancing it. And we try to minimize that. Sure. Yeah. Have you ever... Um, tallied up how many other bankers in this town came through your tutelage? Because <laughs> I personally Ooh. haven't ever met one that, that, <laughs> that hasn't wasn't connected to you at yeah. one or another. Uh, yeah, well, I'm responsible. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's not just in town, it's up, up and down the valley. So I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of really good bankers and work at a lot of really good banks. And um, three in fact, this is my 45th year in banking and I'm finishing up my 12 years at uh, Bank First this summer. So, um, so during that time, I've I've had the pleasure to 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 either manage, supervise, hire, develop. Sometimes they don't work out. Sometimes they I don't work out and they leave. Uh, we have one out in the back over there who's leaving. Where do you go? <laughs> He's going out to greener pastures. Uh, but we prepared him for that, and so uh, we, we feel really good about creating. Uh, Good bankers, uh, skilled bankers, uh, good community citizens, people that understand how to, to to be responsible to the community as well as their 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 organization and their employees. So, um, they're out there and they're.
for the most part, I get good reports. <laughs> Maybe not a common uh, question, but a comment on uh, what you've done to bring this community together is unbelievable. Most people don't realize what we have here, and you've done a lot to bring it together, and for that, I think you, we owe us. We owe you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at, uh, one thing about Waterfest, when you go down there, you, 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 re, you reunite with people you haven't seen for a while. And it's a, there is a huge sense of community down there, and part of the value of Waterfest is to, to get people back together. That might, you, maybe, they don't, maybe they don't go to the same grocery store, or they don't work in the same um, circles, or live in the same circles. But, but down at Waterfest, everything kind of works itself together, and you, and you can't believe the conversations you end up in with people you haven't seen for 10 years. And so it, that's part of the charm of the, the event. Any uh, other questions we got? Yeah. We got, we got to do it. I'm fine. 45 years in the business, 68 years in the community. Give me the lowest time you've ever seen this community and the highest time you've ever seen this community. Wow. Um, well, I think the lowest time was in the early 80s when, when we were going through the Rust Belt uh, uh, trauma uh you know everybody was but you know back then change wasn't wasn't people weren't used to change i mean it would move slowly so it was a the, you know the fact that things were happening so rapidly and people weren't able to respond to it or didn't respond properly uh or couldn't or didn't didn't have the wherewithal or didn't have the vision or experience to made it people didn't have good answers they didn't know how to answer people really lost their their livelihoods, and it was very, very difficult. There were a lot of family-owned, closely held businesses that didn't, didn't, didn't make it, and 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 wealth was destroyed. And and you need wealth and equity in order to to reinvest. And and some of that stuff was just just demolished. And as far as um, being up, uh, I I I think. Uh, there's no reason to not think we're up now. I think yeah. thing, things are great. I think the city looks really good. The riverfront's awesome. Uh, you can find a job if you want one. <laughs> you, can, you can get educated. There's a lot of help out there. People are very interested in your well-being. The health, the health system's really good. Education's working itself into really good shape. Uh, there's alternative education. Um, so I, I think if you, if you, if you kind of look at your opportunities and and uh, blessings uh, now's a good time well, 45 years in the banking industry and you're, and you're leaving soon <laughs> uh, you know you wake up you send me text messages at 4:30 in the morning and emails <laughs> at 4:30 in the morning what, what are you gonna miss most when, once you wind down torturing you <laughs> 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 we should ask him the same question. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, um, I've been in, uh, I've been in transition for 45 years. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm in, I'm really, really pleased with, uh, being able to leave things in good shape and people in places where they can have great careers and, and, and the people and businesses that, uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with or through others with our are in really really good hands so i i i won't miss that aspect of it because i think it's fantastic and and uh so i'll just have to rein, reinvent myself a little bit and and, and uh, keep myself occupied so what's some parting advice you might have for entrepreneurs small business owners or business leaders in the community that, that comes from the heart for mike dempsey well <clears throat> There's a couple of odd, odd things. Uh, sometimes people want to move. They get structurally disadvantaged at, at their place of work, and they go, well, I, I'm going to go into business. And in some cases, they don't know what they're getting into. Uh, in most cases, they're used to a lifestyle of, you know, 9 to 5, 8 to 5. Every two weeks. Weekends, uh, da, 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 that kind of thing. And so when, you, when, you run in, when you're going to run a business, it's 24-7 all the time. And, and again, your employees come first and your customers and then, then you're last. And so that's a brutal awakening. And it sounds like, oh, I can do that. But people just aren't emotionally and um, behaviorally, uh, um, you know, prepared for that. So that you have to really 
do some soul searching before you dive into that. The other thing is, is you, you need to be available. So your health is extremely important. If you're an entrepreneur, everybody's relying on you. And, uh, it's, 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 uh, you're, and you're also doing a lot of other jobs. Uh, and, and as you're growing your business and getting, being able to hire people that can do some other things for you. But if you're, not, if you're not available, if you're not healthy, if you're not taking care of your health, um, uh, you're, 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 you're putting your business at risk. So being available for uh, all your stakeholders is extremely important. And, and making, making good relationships, taking care of your employees is extremely important. Um, and, um, and respecting your competition and learning from them and uh, taking your lumps and, and uh, being a better entrepreneur for it. Yeah. Well, do we have any final questions here? We got one from Rob in the back, and then I think that's probably all we have time for today. Oh, oh we got yeah, two more. one other one. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, um, <clears throat> you know, volunteer-wise, just kind of, you know, you had Waterfest, but you volunteered in countless organizations. Kind of what drove that passion behind being so engaged in the community for many years from a volunteer perspective? And then, you know, besides growing up here, what, what was that passion behind Oshkosh, your passion behind Oshkosh, so um, intense? And, you know, obviously everybody can feel that. If you can just talk a little bit about that. Well, I had really good employers. Um, I did start out in scouting with other people in the audience here, and, and that was very helpful. And you learned a lot about being organized and responsible and a good citizen and, and, uh, and all the good points of the... Uh, uh, that go into scouting, but as I got employed, I had employers that were trying to get me involved, and I, I well, they introduced me to the JCs, and they introduced me to the to the YMCA, and then you know, made a got me on the board at the Y. At, I was in my twenties, and um, and and the Y was cool because they wanted younger people in in the mix, and I fit the profile, and I hopped in there, and uh, and over the years I got familiar with what the possibilities were for myself and the community in, in that area. But when you're, like the JCs were particularly important to me because you were running budgets and in some of these other organizations you're organizing people, volunteers that don't get paid, but you gotta motivate them. You, they, you gotta figure out who's doing what and getting it done and, and you're dealing with people that are performing and not performing and you're, and you're managing a budget which you, which you're which happened way before I was involved in any of that at, in, at work at, in my career. So it gave me a little bit of, it built my skill sets for managing people and resources at a very early age, which helped me prepare myself for opportunities as they came along in my career. Uh, so it was very, very, very helpful. I didn't know it at the time, but it worked out great. And as far as Oshkosh is concerned, it, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people here it's, it's enjoyable to work with them and volunteer with them and work on opportunities, and it's fun. It's, it's really fun and rewarding to see things get done, and, and, and um, why not here? Do you see any big opportunities still out there for Oshkosh, and what are they? Well, we've got a lot going on downtown here that's going to be awesome. We've got a lot of industrial park that can get filled out. Um, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, so there's, a, there's opportunities here in Winnebago County and, and Oshkosh for sure. Um, we have to continue to, to grow our, uh, our, uh, our resources to, to take advantage of that, whether that's human or technology or other investments. And um, so it has a great deal of opportunity. Um, you'd asked earlier about the importance of entrepreneurship, and it's really our, an organic opportunity for, uh, uh, being, for startups and entrepreneur. But businesses themselves are entrepreneurial. They, they, they pivot when opportunities have to create, when they have to because situations dictate it. And so you, even established businesses, big and small, have to be entrepreneurially nimble as change is really, really accelerating. Yeah. There was one more question. Are you thinking of bringing in new genres for Music for Waterfest, like rap, hip hop, bringing in for college students, I know I was there two years ago at UW Oshkosh, so we were big on rap, hip hop. So yeah. have you thought of bringing artists in like Lil Wayne as an example, because he loves the Green Bay Packers? <laughs> or have you brought in the past? That's the prequel. Yeah. Is the, you gotta be a Packer fan. Yeah, yeah we, we, we've had, we, we have had uh, 
some artists that dip into hip hop and, and rap. Uh, Trombone Shorty will be kind of interesting this summer. He'll he'll dip into quite a bit of that stuff. Uh, uh, but otherwise, on the on the roster, no. We, we we used to steer away from country because of Country USA, but we have a core. Our formula is we have a core of of fans that kind of expect accessible music that's similar to them. Now, some hip hop is very accessible, and and if the, if people would only try it, they'd get a kick out of it. I understand that, but uh, so we're we're very careful about taking care of and delivering something that's accessible for people. We don't do super hard rock and we don't, we do, we do some blues, but it's gotta be fun blues, easy accessible blues. But hip hop, um, hip hop would be fun. I mean, I, I, but it's, it, it would have to, it w we've, had, we've had it presented for a hip hop night where you'd have a bunch of uh, artists that would come in on a, on, a, on a package. But when I look at it, it's a lot of money and it's a big gamble and it's a little bit foreign to our core audience. If somebody else wants to produce a hip hop show or something like that, we're, we'd be happy to help uh, give them the resources to take a look at it. You got time for that, Bo? Yeah, you, there's an opportunity. You need you. the money too, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I appreciate the question. Uh, you know, we're, we're a little more diverse this year than we were in past years. So we were pretty much um, 80s, 90s classic rock. And this year it's a little different. We've got some some different stuff in there well great well you know i think that's all, all we're gonna have time for today but i just want to thank you again for taking the time to do this and share your insights with with the community and you've been a huge leader in this organization or in this community and organization with the chamber for so long so we just want to give one great round of applause for mike dempsey thank you thank you